Hi everybody, my name is Katie Sider and I'm making this video to present my research titled Misfits of Society, Hippies and Punks. The goal of my research and of this video is to compare and contrast the London punk movement um, of the 1970s to the hippie movement of 1960s America and show that the two are similar in their goals and in their backgrounds and how they impacted their respective areas and society. I would now like to take the time to discuss the primary sources that I used not only in my research but that will also be presented in this video. The first of those primary sources is fashion. It's important to look at the fashion because fashion at both the time of the punk movement and the hippie movement became an expression of one's own thoughts and opinions. So fashion was drastically changed in both of these movements and it's pretty awesome because you can still see the impacts that the punk movement and the hippie movement has on fashion that we even wear today. The next set of primary sources that will be looked at is magazines and magazines are important to both the punk movement and to the hippie movement because they became a way for the youth to get their ideas and what they wanted changed out to the public and also within their own movement. Um, it was important for those who decided to write these magazines to let everybody know why they felt the way that they did and why their movements were important. Photographs will be the next thing that will be looked at for this presentation and it's because photographs are very, very impactful and you can gain a lot of insight by looking at photographs from the past. The photographs that I have chosen to include in this presentation I think are really, really representative of both the punk movement and the hippie movement and what people were feeling and how they dressed and their attitudes at the time period of both of their respective movements. The use of video is also going to be very important as evidence in my research and how the punk movement is extremely similar to the hippie movement. The video um, that will be included in the bibliography goes over what punks had to go through to stand up for what they felt was right, much like the hippies did, and this includes protests and unfortunately um, police brutality and that sort of thing. Um, but it's so key in understanding how both movements are so similar in their goals and what they thought society should be. In my research, I also use documentaries as primary sources, and that's because documentaries are created in a way that appeal to the public. They give us insight into certain topics and ideas and help us delve even deeper into what was going on in times such as when the punk movement and the hippie movement took place. Interviews will also be used as primary sources and it's because interviews are a great way to understand what key players in the punk movement we're thinking. Um, there will be the use of interviews by members of the Clash and um, by musician and political activist Tom Robinson. And it's pretty awesome because they voice their opinions but do it in a way that it's very, very relatable to the hippie movement and what hippies were facing in their own time. Last and probably most important will be the use of music as a primary source. And that's because music was so impactful in both the punk movement and the hippie movement. And it became a main way for the youth to send out messages of what they thought society should change and that the change was coming even if society didn't want it to. And so music was also changed by these movements forever. And it's really important to look at to understand how both movements are similar but also different. To start off, I'd like to give a little bit of background on the hippie movement. And basically, the hippie movement started in San Francisco in the 1960s and kind of became a phenomenon that spread across the United States. Hippies were usually young people, and they preached the ideas of peace and love for all people. And they wanted rights for more than just the white male in America. Um, they did marches and protested that way, but they also changed fashion and music and magazines. 
um, all to express how they felt about what society and the government were doing in America during the Vietnam conflict and also just in society in general. Before talking about my own research, I'd like to delve a little bit into the historiography of the punk movement. There are many books and scholarly articles um, based on specific bands and what the punk movement was and what brought it on and that sort of thing. But there are not, however, a whole lot of studies based on comparing the punk movement to other movements such as the hippie movement. Two books that I found while I was researching were Oh So Pretty, Punk in Print by Toby Mott and Punk, which is a, the culture in pictures. So most of these are based off of primary sources such as pictures or print articles, that kind of thing. But as I said before, there's not a whole lot in the way of looking at the punk movement and comparing it to what preceded it in other parts of the world. So now um, we're going to turn the focus of the presentation onto um, the fashion of the 1960s and how the counterculture or hippie movement changed the fashion. Um, for starters, clothing became more free and loose. Um, clothing that kind of sagged off the body became more popular. Um, it also became more acceptable for women to wear pants because they were searching for that equality, even in the sense of clothing, for women to be the same as men. Um, floral patterns also became more popular for both men and women because the hippies were really, really involved with nature and thought that it was almost kind of a sacred aspect of society. The purpose of the changes to the clothing was to show the freedom and the equality that the young people involved in the counterculture movement wanted to see in society and it's kind of cool because if you go to a store now you can still see that inspiration in clothing with the floral prints in both men's and women's fashion. Most of the time women wear pants now and you can also see it um, in the fact that women are being able to be more free with their bodies and how they want their bodies to be shown in public. So in summary for both groups, um, they both wanted the rights in the workplace and in society that they thought that they were lacking at the time that the movements had started. And neither group was necessarily shy when it came to the protesting of the government and of the established society. But the hippies tended to be a little more cryptic and have hidden messages in their songs and in their written word, whereas the punks tended to be more blunt with what they were feeling. The main idea for both movements, though, was to get rights that the youth felt that they were lacking and to get those rights also for minorities and for people who were considered outcasts of society such as themselves. Now, taking a look at um, punk fashion, the best way I can describe it is that fashion became edgy and kind of worn looking. Um, ripped jeans were really popular, as were leather jackets. Eccentric hairstyles, um, colored very brightly, also became popular during this time period. Safety pins and chains became common accessories and were used to express how people felt and knew that if they were punk, they were going to be the outcasts of society. And the purpose was to express this sentiment and this feeling that they knew that they didn't belong, but that they really didn't care. Um, it's really interesting to actually kind of see how some of those ideas have carried into our fashion today and left a lasting impact. Um, you can't even walk into a store anymore without seeing ripped jeans. And people color their hair all sorts of weird and funky colors all the time and it's really become a way for people to express themselves and it all started with the punk movement. So in the case of both the punk movement and the hippie movement, clothes became a way for one to express what they were feeling and what they thought should be changed in society and how they felt about society. Now to talk a little bit about who the punks were and a little bit of background on the punk movement in London. And basically the punks were young people um, in London who felt that there needed to be changes to society and how they lived. 
and um, the punks were a little more blatant in what they believed in and in getting their message across and they did it the same way that the hippies did with music and fashion and writings and they made it very very clear that they did not care that they were the outcasts of society they just wanted the rights that they felt that they were lacking and they wanted those rights too for minorities and for women much like the hippies did um, the key to remember when it comes to the punk movement is unlike the hippie movement the punks did not care by what mode they reached their rights as long as they got them and that the change was made that they saw fit. So in short, the punks were not necessarily looking for the feelings of love and peace in their community. They just wanted a change to be made and the quicker that it was made, the better. Now we're going to look at one of Punk's most popular magazines. Um, the title of the magazine was Sniff and Glue, and it was released in England in 1976. The magazine, just like Rolling Stone, did not have a whole lot of funding, but it was the brainchild of a man named Mark Perry, and it was so he could express how he felt about punk music and the movement itself and what was happening within the movement. Um, there was a lot of critiques and music reviews and concert reviews, the magazine became wildly popular in England among the punk crowds and it became a way for them to see how others were reacting to what they were doing within their own movement. Now we're going to shift our attention over to magazines and what they represented at the time period. The first magazine that we're going to look at is Rolling Stone and Rolling Stone was started in 1967 and the magazine was released with very, very little funding and only a few people were involved in writing it. Um, the original intent of the magazine was to explore music and to critique music, but also to look at the political thought of the young American, which meant that the counterculture movement definitely used this as a mode to voice their opinions on the Vietnam War and also how they felt about the government and society itself. The magazine was a mode of expression for these people. In fact, the first edition of Rolling Stone, the first issue, um, featured a picture of John Lennon in kind of army military garb. And this was used as a piece or a picture to protest what was happening in the United States. The next section of my presentation is going to be about the documentary Punk in London. It was filmed in 1977 and the purpose of it was to explore the movement and the music of the punk movement and the culture of it and show others around the world what it was really about. The thing that's so interesting about punk in London is the fact that it gives firsthand accounts of bands such as The Clash and bands that I'll talk about on the next slide such as Chelsea. And they talk about their inspiration and why they chose to do punk music as opposed to other forms of music. And it's really, really insightful and important to the research that I did for this project. Another aspect of the documentary Punk in London that I would like to look at is the imagery that is represented in the film. To me, it's really important to look at these things because it can be very representative of what people were going through at the time. And what was most striking to me was the condition of the buildings, the bars, the clubs that these punk bands were playing in and also that punks would meet in. And they were very, very kind of dirty and dim and dank looking. And this was very reminiscent to me of pictures that I've seen of Woodstock. I mean, obviously it wasn't on the same scale, but people were just congregating and they didn't care that they were the outcasts of society or where they had to go as long as they could hear the message of their movement and what they felt that they fit in with. And I think that that is really important to look at in the case of both movements. And overall, I would say that this is what stood out the most to me in the entire film itself. In continuing the discussion on the documentary Punk in London, while there are tons of interviews, the one with the band Chelsea stands out the most to me. And it's because while they're being interviewed, they're asked by the interviewer why they chose to be punk and to write the songs that they had written. And Gene October, their lead singer, said that they were tired of listening to songs that were about love and heartbreak and that they wanted to write songs about the right for the individual to do their own thing. 
And I found this to be very impactful because it is so reminiscent of what the hippie movement was and what it stood for. It is about the individual being able to find what they want to be and what they want to do and to do it without any dislike or disdain from society and how society felt about what they wanted to be. So now I'm just going to talk about a few conclusions that I came up with and a few things that I learned from the film Punk in London. And one of the very first things that I recognized was that the youth at the time really, really used music as an outlet for their anger and their angst and how they felt. Um, I also learned that there were struggles for punks. I mean, the, where they came from and where they had to perform, it wasn't exactly the best way for them to go about doing their music, but because society viewed them the way that they did, they had to do it that way. And I also came to the conclusion from this movie that the punks were quite a bit like the hippies and the fact that they knew that they were outcasts of society and they just kind of rolled with it. They stood up for what they believed in through music and through other ways of culture, but it was really important to me that they persevered and still did what they believed in even though society was pushing them down. Before I show the photographs that I use as primary sources in my research, I'd like to say that I think that all of the photographs that I present here I think are very representative of the punk movement and the hippie movement and that it gives us a glimpse into what things were like for the punks and the hippies. These photographs will be compared and contrasted and instead of it being bullet points like all my other slides before this have been, I'm going to kind of give my own view of the photos and what I think they represent and how they're similar and how they're different. On this slide there are two photos. The black and white photo is representative of the hippie movement and the other photo that is in color is representative of the punk movement. Um, the thing that was striking to me about both of these photos is first of all the people who are involved in both movements are young people. The other thing that was surprising to me is how you can see that the world is just kind of passing them by and there are other people on the street but they aren't really paying attention to what the hippies or the punks are doing and I think that that's kind of fascinating in the sense that it does show how they were misfits of society and how they both had that in common with one another. It was also really interesting to me that in both cases the youth in the pictures who are involved in the movements are not by themselves and instead they're with one or more people and I think that this is important because in a lot of aspects people of both the punk movement and the hippie movement would come together to voice their opinions and their reasoning behind why they felt the way that they did. This next set of photos to me was really impactful in the way that it depicted how police treated both the punk movement and the hippie movement. And it didn't matter if they were protesting or if they were just walking down the street. The police were there and they were always watching what each of these groups were doing. And I find this interesting because in both pictures there are youth who are in groups. The left hand side shows the hippie movement while the right hand side shows the punk movement. And they are doing nothing it seems to call the attention of the police upon them, but they're still there watching every move that they're making. And I think that this shows what society itself thought of both the punks and the hippies and how they were truly outcasts of the society that they lived in. The next section of my presentation will be about interviews and videos that will compare and contrast the movements, but also give insight into how people felt and why they felt the way that they did moving into their movements and becoming hippies or punks. In the one video that I'm going to talk about for this presentation, punks are depicted in a way that makes them the victims of society and I think that it's important to look at because in this video they're marching in London and they're protesting the government and what they feel like is blocking them from getting their rights as human beings. And the thing that's so striking about this video is the fact that there is quite a bit of police brutality toward the punks. And this is reminiscent to me of the counterculture movement and the marches that they also did during their time in the 60s. It actually kind of reminds me of the protests at Kent State that ultimately ended in violence and it was very tragic and very sad and it just gives insight into while there may not have been deaths in this video, 
there was still struggle and there was still hurt and there was still violence used to try to stop these people from voicing their opinions, much like the hippies faced in the 1960s. So this part of my presentation is going to be about interviews. And the first interview that I'd like to talk about is one with Tom Robinson, who, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, was not only a musician who had his own band, but he was a political activist. And I think the thing that was so interesting about this interview is that the interviewer asks Tom if he finds bands like The Clash overrated. And his response to that was no, and that he thought that bands should be supporting one another because in the end their goals were all the same and that there should not be animosity between one punk band and another because they were all fighting for the rights of each other. And I thought that this was really cool and kind of tuned into the hippie idea of peace and harmony and how working together was going to make more of an impact than trying to work separately. The next interview that I'm going to talk about is the interview of The Clash on the British TV show Something Else. And the thing that was so unique about this interview is the fact that the members of the band are being interviewed along with a woman who is active in British politics. And the woman is very surprised and impressed when the band members have actual knowledge on what is taking place in the British government and in society as a whole, and that they have ideas that make sense and that they're not just unfounded and trying to get their way, and that their concerns and their opinions are based on fact and not based just on how they think things should be. In this next interview or video about The Clash, the camera kind of follows the band around to see what their routines are before a show and what they go through and what they have to deal with in the places that they perform. This video was probably one of the most important primary sources that I found, and it was because there was footage of Joe Strummer listening to a Martin Luther King speech. And this is so important because it shows that leaders of the punk movement found inspiration in 1960s America and what people stood for and their rights and how they felt they should be treated on a daily basis. Another really interesting aspect of this video is the fact that when The Clash get to the venue where they're going to have their concert, they let people in for free. And it's just so that kids can hear the message of their music and enjoy listening to them live. And this, to me, was very reminiscent of, again, Woodstock and how people were able to come and not have to be charged to get in to listen to the music and the message that Woodstock had to offer. This next video is about the British punk band The Damned and how the United States reacted to them. And it was interesting to watch because right off the bat, you can tell that the narrator is skeptical of what is taking place on the screen. Just by the tone in the narrator's voice, it can be heard that the damned are not being taken very seriously and that society probably was not taking them very seriously at the time either. In the next video titled The Hippie Temptation, there is a look into what the hippie culture was and how the United States viewed that culture. It's really reminiscent of the video of The Damned because you can tell that the narrator is once again skeptical of the hippie movement and the music that went along with it. Looking at the music of the counterculture is really interesting and there are many artists that can be looked at but I chose for this presentation to look at Bob Dylan in particular and that's because he was such a big part of hippie music and the counterculture movement that I think it's important to talk about him. And the song that I chose to talk about is The Times There Are a Change In. And to me, this is representative of the hippie movement because they wanted that change and they were going to force it to happen, whether people were ready for it or not. And that's what this song is saying, that people need to prepare themselves and get ready for the change because it was going to come whether they wanted it to or not. Now taking a look at punk music, the first album that I'm going to talk about is Power in the Darkness by the Tom Robinson Band. This album is a great example of the politically charged message in punk music with songs titled Glad to be Gay, Ain't Gonna Take It, and Up Against the Wall, one can easily see that Tom Robinson and his band were not going to go down without 
fighting for what they thought was right. And this would have been something that young punks would have found a lot of inspiration in. And they would have had hope that there was changes that were going to come based on people who are politically active and who are willing to put their thoughts and their emotions out like Tom Robinson did on this album. The last album that I'm going to talk about in this presentation is London Calling by The Clash, and it's arguably the biggest album to come out of the London punk movement. And the great thing about it is, is that it is representative of the punk movement with its strong political lyrics, along with the demands of rights for every person, not just those in the upper class and government. So this album really shows what punks wanted and what they were going through to get it. It also gives a little bit of a narrative on what the everyday life was for a youth in London with songs like Lost in the Supermarket. It shows that punks not only wanted rights and for change, but that they also were just disenchanted with everyday life and what their parents had become used to in society. After analyzing all of the primary sources that were presented in this video, I came to the conclusion that the hippie movement and the punk movement were very much so alike. Both movements focused on youth and how they wanted to make a change in their society and to gain rights that they thought that they lacked. They also wanted to gain rights for minorities and for women, which hadn't been done before. It is also important to notice that they expressed their feelings and their want for change in their music, fashion, and writings. In a quote by Margaret Mead, she said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So whether you're studying the punk movement, the counterculture movement, or anything else, it's important to realize that these individuals made an impact and a change that we can still see today in our own world. The last section of my presentation will be about the music that surrounded both the punk movement and the hippie movement. And the music is perhaps the most important primary source, and that's because it was so impactful in both situations. It was also used as an outlet for expression and feelings of the time period, and it became a way to show others that hippies and punks both didn't care that they were the outsiders of their communities and their societies, that they just wanted the rights that they thought that they didn't have.